Thank you, Carly, and welcome everyone and welcome to our brilliant panellists. Um, so as Carly said, what this session is really all about is questions of accountability in the context of tech. And we have three amazing panellists who I will introduce shortly, who are going to talk to you about some of their experiences being really on the front line of trying to bring a measure of transparency and accountability to the fast paced tech world that we are now all living in. Um, I am the director of Liberty, the human rights organization, and we do some work on tech and surveillance and data rights. And I think it's fair to say that along with other lawyers and campaigners and journalists and academics, we are all trying to grapple with how you have meaning, meaningful tools of accountability and transparency in the context of technology where the pace of change is very fast, uh, the level of literacy in our democratic institutions is relatively low, old systems of regulation and accountability are simply not pacey or muscular enough to keep up with technological developments. And sadly, even though tech perhaps can be an innovative solution to many social issues, what we often actually see is tech solutions exacerbating existing inequalities, existing injustice, um, and existing unfairness. And so one of the things that I think it would be really useful to hear from the panel today is the tools and the strategies and the tactics that they use in order to try and expose some of those inequities and work to put in place systems and processes to make sure that tech can be much more fair uh, for everybody. Obviously, at the moment, many of these challenges have been exacerbated and brought to the fore by the COVID-19 crisis. And we're seeing tech as being offered up both as a kind of grand solution to a public health problem and also a huge barrier um, to accessing solutions to public health issues. Some of the barriers, of course, are that big business and big corporates are much more involved in this space than perhaps in other areas of public policy and public decision making that lawyers and activists like me are used to working in. Another is that the tech itself is often pretty difficult and impenetrable, and that in turn means that the level of democratic participation, whether by the public or by parliamentarians or activists or lawyers, in the, in the meat and bread of what that tech actually is and what it's doing is very difficult. And of course, related to that is that much of the tech is often shielded by a corporate veil contained within a black box. And so what we understand traditionally to to be accountability and transparency simply isn't realizable um, in the way that it is in other contexts that we're used to working in. So it will be really valuable to hear from, we have two brilliant strategic lawyers and one brilliant journalist um, who are all gonna talk about how their work is contributing to making tech more accountable for everybody. And they're gonna kick off one by one just by giving their thoughts and a bit of a provocation for then a later discussion um, on the issues around investigating and prosecuting AI and tech more generally. So first of all, it is my pleasure to introduce Ravi Knight, who is I'm sure known to many of you as a lawyer who has been working in the data rights field for a really long time now. Um, he appeared, for example, I'm sure many of you have seen The Great Hack, and Ravi appeared in that. Um, and he's recently left his private practice firm to set up a data rights agency called AWO, and he's also a visiting fellow um, at the Oxford Internet Institute. Um, so Ravi is going to talk to us a little bit about his work, and then I'm sure we'll contribute uh, to the discussion on the role of strategic litigation in blowing open these issues so that the public can better understand and challenge them. Thanks, Ravi. Thank you, Martha, and uh, thank you everyone for being here. And thank you, Ada Lovelace, for putting on this excellent um, discussion. Um, and it's a great to topic to be speaking on. And um, before I, I get into the meat about what I want to talk about, I just want to take a step back and think about and consider what does prosecuting AI actually mean? And what does it mean in practice and some of the gaps that may need to be plugged? In summary, it's a question of accountability. And to be clear, the regulations around technology are not new. We can look back to a long history of legislation uh, that's been designed to curtail and provide accountability for digital automation. You look, can look, for example, at the Privacy Act uh, in the US of 1974, which was created in the shadow of the Watergate scandal, about how the creation and the use of computerized databases may impact on individual privacy rights. And we fast forward to today, we have obviously the GDPR, which provides a framework for the idea in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights that data protection is a fundamental right of itself. And the GDPR is an evolution of decades of data protection law. It now provides a detailed and coherent charter of rights for individuals to have against those that control their data. 
And I've been able to use that framework to bring pressure to bear on modern technology as we start to understand it. And the most notable case I think most people will know about are proceedings for Professor David Carroll against Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica were a small political consultancy in London who are said to have conducted huge data processing operations for political campaigns. Notably, they're said to have worked on behalf of the Trump campaign. It remains quite unclear what they actually did, but Professor Carroll was able to use the data protection regime before the GDPR to access his information. He received some limited information and that was quite illuminating, quite a watershed moment, because it showed that the company had been processing data and data about him on his political opinions. And we argue that that data was, the way that data was processed was incomplete and that the processing of his opinions did not have a sufficient legal underpinning to be lawful. And the regulator of data in the UK, the information commissioner, agreed with our position and ultimately prosecuted the company. And since that case, I've now started to run my own, um, uh, or start, I've co-established a legal data rights agency called AWO. Um, and our entire caseload is about modern technology and holding that technology to account. Um, for instance, we act on the leading regulatory complaint about the advertising technology industry, which has led to the ICO reporting that the industry is essentially unable to comply with the GDPR in its current form. Uh, further, we act on a case about the data black hole that is Google, and we've challenged Google to explain what they actually do with data once it enters the Google complex. Our client, Dr. Johnny Ryan, was concerned there was no limit on what Google could do once um, they, the, one of the companies under the Google banner received your personal information, which creates an effective data fee for all within Google. And when we push Google on what they do and what the limits are with that data, Google refused to adequately explain what they're doing. It's now subject to a regulatory complaint before the Data Protection Commission in Ireland. Uh, most recently, AWO were instructed alongside their counsel team led by Matt Ryder QC to produce a legal opinion on the human rights implications of the tech responses to coronavirus. I've also been instructed by Open Rights Group to challenge the lack of safeguards around the implementation of the test and trade system in the UK and related measures such as data sharing that Foxglove Corey's organisation are doing so much to show some transparency on. But more broadly, the capacity of the regulation is yet to be fully tested. For example, there are compliance orders which are really broad, which can be sought under the GDPR, including orders to stop processing. And those types of orders are quite dramatic and could shift an industry change their entire practices. And we're pursuing some of those um, procedures in our cases. And these are just some of the examples of the GDPR to leverage modern technology and modern power. Indeed, the scope of that regulation to engender change is quite vast. The most critiques of that re regime are about enforcement deficits rather than substantive problems. But there are actual problems that the title of this panel throws up, cases against AI. Firstly, most of the cases that we're involved in, and I'm sure most other people in this space are involved in, um, are about quite rudimentary data processing activities. Even with quite sophisticated tech, you can still normally identify a controller of that information and bring accountability to bear. Um, we're not really showing cases where tech itself is the problem, but rather how tech gets used by those controlling it. Thus, there's a chain of causation for um, mistakes and accountability. But the rub will come with a relationship between an individual affected by technology and an individual controlling that technology breaks down. And what happens where that control is not identifiable? This isn't an abstract notion. Google argued, for example, that search operates without any input, so therefore they should not be responsible for what search does. Courts rejected that argument, but what happens when there's more sophisticated technology? Um, that's where accountability deficits start to um, ensue. And as we enter a future wash with data and digital um, solutionism, we need to address those problems quite head on. And I'm really glad we're having that discussion here today about how that might look. Thanks. Thanks, Ravi. Data and digital solutionism feels like a great phrase, one of which we could perhaps use to guide our discussion today. And um, so moving on then to our second panelist, Adam Santariano, who is a tech correspondent for the New York Times. And I said in my introduction, you know, I think it has been a powerful combination and, and camaraderie between strategic litigators and investigative journalists that often has managed to blow open some of these issues for the public scrutiny that they need and deserve. And Adam is one of those investigative journalists who has brought many of these issues to the fore. So as I'm sure you know, he writes on a whole range of issues from tech to privacy to disinformation from the European perspective and also from the American perspective. And one of his most kind of well-read and I think most fascinating stories was a piece and that you worked on with a colleague on exposing the way that algorithmic decision making makes decisions 
central to everybody's freedom, both in the in the European context and in the US. And it, it was work that I think for me really called to mind the work of Virginia Eubanks um, on algorithms in the welfare system. Adam's work went wider and looked at a whole different range of issues, whether AI in the context of the criminal justice system or in benefits or in employment. Um, and it's one of the things that I'm sure that the audience would like us to kind of come back to later because it's such a key area of accountability. So Adam, over to you. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my arc as a journalist because I think it, it it explains a little bit about how coverage of technology has changed over the past number of years. Um, so I first started writing about technology about nine years ago and uh, I was in Silicon Valley at the time out of uh, working in San Francisco and the coverage was uh, my main responsibility, my beat was really covering Apple and some of the other big companies there. And at the time, coverage was really about um, you know, the gadgets, the iPhone was a couple years old. There was all this incredible excitement around apps that were being created. And uh, there was great promise around technology and excitement around that. Um, but, you know, as we are now, we see how quickly things have changed and, and the role of journalism around technology has, has changed with it. Uh, as these companies have gotten so much bigger uh, and have so much influence on our society, um, they should be covered as such. And so um, that's uh, one thing that I see as my responsibility as, as a journalist and, and something that we try and do uh, at the New York Times. I work with uh, a number of colleagues who, who cover technology uh, as well as others at many other outlets who sort of are trying to look at technology in this prism of the way that it is changing the way that we live and work and, the, and, the, and how people, governments, and companies are responding to that change. Uh, and I think artificial intelligence if it just to, is one branch of that. Um, and it's one of the more challenging ones for a lot of the reasons that have already been mentioned. Um, one is its, uh, its complexity, and, uh, and it, it, which makes it often inaccessible to uh, a reader or also sometimes makes it incredibly difficult for a journalist uh, to explain in a way that conveys what is going on. Um, and then two, um, a lot of what is happening is, is done by private companies whose uh, responsibility to disclose how the decision making of these algorithms is, are made um, is, is very opaque. Um, and in, in other times is just trying to find the third thread here is just trying to find the humans and people who are being affected by this. And so it's kind of these things then trying to pull them together in a way that explain them to readers uh, to better understand how this technology works in our society. Um, and so I'm looking forward to the conversation here. I can talk about specific stories or uh, experiences that I've gone through, but uh, looking forward to right. talking to everyone. Thank you, Adam. So our final panelist who I'm delighted to introduce is Corey Kreider. So Corey is another great giant of our legal advocacy work here in the UK, started out as a US lawyer um, did amazing work with Reprieve, campaigning against the death penalty, uh, as well as other issues, and now has founded her own NGO together with um, her partner, Martha Dark. And their work is focused exclusively on looking at abuse of power by digital technology. And so standing up to the big beasts that we, some people have just been referencing, the Amazons and the Facebooks of the world, on behalf of the user, on behalf of the worker, on behalf of the public good. Um, certainly, speaking for myself, it feels like it's a gap in the NGO sector that Corey has filled, which is absolutely critical and couldn't be more important now in the current health crisis. So, Corey, over to you. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. And thanks to Ada for hosting these sessions. Um, so I wanted to talk to everybody about power. Uh, Foxglove, Martha and I set Foxglove up because having done national security work for about a decade, we started to feel that the next great threat to kind of social justice was basically concentrated tech power, uh, be it in the Facebooks or the Googles or also in the governments of the world. So we're a nonprofit organization that is investigating and litigating those issues. Now, I assume everybody is here listening because they are thinking, well, 
actually, I've got some concerns about AI and fairness and, and where do I go? How do I, how do I begin to kind of unpick those problems in my company or in the world at large? And I didn't have a slide, but if I had a slide for you, I think the one I would put up is just the Wizard of Oz. I'd put up the wizard uh, behind the curtain and say, what we all actually need to do is to pay attention to the man behind the curtain. Early in the debates when AI started to kind of become politicized a few years ago, you would hear tons of discussions about ethics in AI, differential privacy, explainable algorithms, and so forth and so on, quite technical debates. Those debates are important, and I don't wish to denigrate the work of people who do that work to try to unpick some of the technical problems in AI, but I wanna suggest that at this moment, with the use of mass data systems by the police, by government, by these corporations. That's not actually the core issue. The core issue is the man behind the curtain. It's all of us. The problem is the balance of power in our society. The rollout of these systems for the acquisition and use of information about all of us on a mass scale is driven by people. Not by the algorithms by themselves, but by people. And those people have values that get baked into the algorithmic systems just as they would into any piece of law, any policy paper, anything else. And those values are not gonna privilege everyone equally. We've seen it again and again. So what does that mean in the UK today? Now, you've probably heard of a, a, a man uh, advising the prime minister, a guy called Dominic Cummings. And you may have heard, if you've read one of his 50,000 word blogs, that he has long harbored aspirations for a sort of vast datafied machine at the heart of government. Uh, you may have even seen pictures of him walking around wearing a U.S. Naval Intelligence Force uh, uh, lanyard that says, in God we trust, all others we monitor. And I think that's actually, that, that's very revealing about some of the politics behind the acquisition and the rollout of some of these systems in governments now, right? There is an effort to maintain a power imbalance and a power asymmetry uh, that permits the aggregation of more and more and more information about you and me and everybody else, whereas behind these systems, behind the wall of, say, an algorithmic decision system, uh, we know less and less and less about them. So let's take one example from a recent case that Fox both brought. At the height of the coronavirus crisis during the COVID-19 pandemic, the government suddenly announced that it was going to create a COVID-19 data store to provide a so-called single source of truth about the pandemic. What that meant was instead of going through a, like a public tender process where companies bid, uh, overnight co contracts were awarded to some of the biggest names in tech, such as Microsoft, Amazon Web Services, they even tried out Google for a bit, uh, and some other lesser known but actually pretty concerning companies such as Faculty AI uh, and Palantir. Now, not everybody on this, on this discussion is gonna know who either of those are. Faculty AI are the data science company who are best known for running data science operations for Vote Leave, uh, which is the connection to Cummings. And they have won, I believe now, at least eight government contracts worth 1.6 million pounds in the past 18 months. The other company, Palantir, is one that I know of all from my time in the national security sphere. Palantir are essentially a sort of a data aggregator, data crunching um, security firm that cut their teeth assisting the counterinsurgency operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, who have contract after contract after contract with the American police systems that thousands of Americans are now rising up and protesting, uh, and who came under intense fire last year for their support for immigration and customs enforcements in the United States regime of deportations and family separations at the United States border. That is the company that was contracted with the NHS to provide a quote, single source of truth about the pandemic. Now we saw this announcement and we just thought, well, hang on, we got a whole bunch of questions here about how this works uh, and whether it's lawful. One, what are the terms on which these companies are getting access to the data? How are we to be sure that they aren't taking the NHS for a ride? Uh, there is this deep question about public value for a public asset. Some independent estimates say that NHS health data untapped is actually worth about 10 billion quid a year to the NHS. We all know that the NHS really needs more money, but you know, how can we be sure that that public value for the public asset was protected? Uh, then of course, all the core questions about privacy that everybody has, right? There have been prior problems with NHS data not being kept simply for healthcare purposes, but being used to enforce things like the hostile environment. So we wanted to know something about 
how the systems are actually going to be, quote, anonymized, which was a promise that was made about the data store. And then finally, I guess there's just this question of moral fitness and moral hazard. And if a company like Palantir, whose bread and butter since its very inception has been to support the military and to support the intelligence services, and they now want to pivot to health because there's more money in health, in fact, is that a fit and proper partner for our national health service? So in any event, we've started that debate by basically saying that the government needed to disclose to us the data sharing agreements and other contractual information underpinning this giant data store and data deal. We were about to sue on Friday, and I, to their credit, they did finally give up uh, redacted versions of some of the documents. We're still analyzing the documents, but there are real problems, and I think showed why actually you've got to have more transparency over these systems. So for example, the original versions of the contracts apparently released the intellectual property that was going to emerge from the work on the system to the companies. So an AI company like faculty, which exists to basically ingest data, uh, find patterns from the data and build models on top of that and then sell it on, uh, potentially could have profited off this emergency, vast access to one of the world's largest uh, res reserves of kind of longitudinal health data in the world. They then say that they have modified that after our freedom of information request was put in. Uh, they say that they now have relinquished all the IP and put it back to the NHS. Um, now, I think that kind of raises a whole bunch of questions. One, did they do it because the FOI was in? Uh, two, what should the standard be going forward, right? If there are going to be partnerships between public bodies, the NHS or any other kind of public body in the, in the United Kingdom, what are the terms on which they're going to get, companies are going to get access to that data and how do we preserve public value for a public asset? All right, anyway, that's the beginning of that discussion. Transparency, you can, you can all go onto the Open Democracy website who are our uh, partners in the litigation and you can look at the documents. We hope that people will kind of help us analyze them and kind of push for a wider debate about these issues going forward. The next thing I'll talk about just very briefly, because I know we want to get into a bit of a back and forth here, has to do with bias and the extent to which racism gets baked into these systems because racism is, racism is out there in the world. It's there with us in society. So uh, we've also brought with the Joint Council on the Welfare of Immigrants what I think is probably the first case in the UK about an automated or algorithmic decision system. And again, let's not make this out to be more than it is. We ain't talking about a neural net here. We're not talking about some kind of vastly complicated system. It's going to be kind of if you come from a nation where people are overwhelmingly non-white, then you are more likely to be risky. How do we know that? because the Home Office admitted to us that every visa applicant to the United States, uh, to the United Kingdom, excuse me, uh, will be graded for risk, green, yellow, and red. Uh, and that will stream their application and determine the level of scrutiny that they get. And they have a list of suspect nationalities uh, who are much more likely to be streamed red. It's no surprise for guessing that the nationalities who are more likely to be streamed red tend to be those uh, who have an overwhelming majority of non-white citizens. And so we just asked the government in our pre-action correspondence, the set of letters you have to send back and forth to the government before you sue them. We said, how does a country get on the suspect list? How does it get on the list of suspect nationalities? And they say, well, by negative or adverse events. And we say, well, what's, a, what's an adverse event? And it turns out to be things like denial of a visa. So if you stop and you think for a minute, you think, hang on. So if there's already an unbalance, if there's already a kind of a, a race or nationality imbalance in the way that visas are granted, and you then feed that data back into your algorithm, it's going to have the same problem that a whole bunch of predictive policing systems did in the United States. It's going to go and tell you to do what you've already done again. And that's exactly the problem that we have found with this system. It's just lather, rinse, repeat. So in any event, I think all of us who are starting to realize that these systems have operated with a democratic deficit for many, many years and are seeking to pull them back into the realm of kind of contested politics and law, let's not anthropomorphize these systems. Let's recognize that it's humans who built them, humans who run them, and humans who have to account for them. And I have to say, speaking for my nonprofit and a whole bunch of other lawyers who do work on this very hard and for free, there are a number of people who will now challenge those systems with and for you. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. So we've got about 20 minutes for a discussion before then there'll be coffee break and then breakout sessions where the audience will then be able to pitch in on this conversation. Um, 
I wondered if I could ask something quite broad, kind of following on from what Corey talked about, but touching really on all of your work and you could perhaps in turn offer your reflections on it. So this question of structural inequality and mindful of course of what's going on everywhere in the world at the moment with the Black Lives Matter protests. And personally, I couldn't agree more with Corey that it's dangerous to forget the people and the politics in these decisions and that there is a real risk that if you fail to see that tech masks people and politics and power, then you will fail to grapple with the fundamental issue. I guess my question is, given the imbalance of power, how can you use law and journalism to meaningfully, first of all, try and attack some of those systems of state oppression. So whether it's racist policing or Islamophobic counter-terror policy or xenophobic hostile environment policies. So how can you get to those? But also then how can you try and genuinely break down, expose, challenge these big systems that while not new in terms of the inequalities they entrench are allowing these inequalities to be replicated and entrenched at a scale hitherto unknown and impossible for the for our kind of power hungry politicians um so from a journalist point of view and like corey from your perhaps also from your national security perspective and ravi given you've spent a lot of time suing the police in your life um how do you bring those two things together the big tech systems and trying to make them accountable with also fighting for a less oppressive world of state power do you want to start adam from a journalist perspective Sure. I mean, I'll, I'll talk about a, a, a particular story. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I want to note that you know I come to these sort of things as is with as uh, an investigator and as a journalist, and, and I'm, I'm not trying to prosecute it um, in, some, in the same sort of way. But um, you know, I think that the, the the key here is trying to is obviously getting the evidence uh, of the wrongdoing and then being able to demonstrate it. And so, um, for instance, the story that uh, a colleague of mine, Kay Metz and I did, uh, one piece of this involved a program in the, the Netherlands. Uh, and this program was about a software system that was used to measure whether or not somebody was committing welfare fraud. Uh, and so the, the government in Rotterdam uh, was using this software system, but they were only using it in some distinct neighborhoods. And so those neighborhoods were overwhelmingly low income, overwhelmingly uh, immigrant neighborhoods. And so, you know, and then beyond that, trying to show whether or not you sort of press on that a little bit and try and get the government to disguise, okay, it's like you're doing this, but why? And what is the evidence of what you're doing that it's working? Uh, and in, in some respects, in many respects, the government just fell completely short. They, they could not produce uh, the sort of evidence to show that what they were doing was working. Uh, and so as something like that got publicized, I mean, we, we wrote our story about it, but there was some uh, local journalists who wrote about it as well. And there was some local uh, labor unions and human rights lawyers who were on the case. Uh, and as more transparency came to light, um, the a court struck down the use of that technology and now the government has sort of backed away from it. Uh, and so I think that, you know, just from my perspective as a journalist, and I think I'd share this with others, it's just like is having more transparency and bringing more to light about how these systems work and how it's affecting people's lives. Thank you, Adam. And Ravi, bearing in mind your your kind of experience of these issues. And I know that one of the things that you wrote is that law can be a gentle civilizer of technology. So bearing that in mind, perhaps offer your reflections on that comment and how therefore it might be the case that the law can be used to dismantle some of these structural inequalities. Yeah, and those really great questions and great comments from the other panelists. So just building on what Adam said and also what Adam's done, I think one of the things from our perspective we act for clients people come to us and they've had an issue with either the state or some other form of power using technology that's in a way affected their lives and what we we tend to do is we use a, a range of different laws but we look to find a way firstly to get transparency around what's happened that's often very difficult but as uh Corey's alluded to it's about looking not just to see well what's the technology done but what's the human involved in the process what's the decision that's made and how do you hold that decision to account we seek transparency but then we use the frameworks 
to try to either say, well, pro processing needs to be fair. So, for example, we've acted for journalists who have been subject to accreditation decisions or decisions by the police, where there's been no transparency around that decision making. Once we push, you get some transparency, and then you look at the core of how that decision was made, and you say, well, that's not fair. And one of the basic concepts in the data protection regime is that data should be processed fairly. And it's those basic formulations around the law that allow you to have a lot of fun sometimes as a lawyer, but also a lot of impact for your client to say, well, actually, what you're doing here are against basic principles and human rights norms. So we're all quite used to in traditional human rights and public law contexts that you start to apply to new forms of power. And actually, there's quite an open field for us to, to be able to move towards big tech with those basic principles of fairness, uh, equality and um, rational decision making. And that that phrase that I used about the gentle civilizer of technology, it's a piece that I had uh, a talk that I did at Harvard that was published then by Harvard. Um, it was drawing on a um, book about the evolution of international law by Marty Koskinyemi called The Gentle Civilizer of Nations, where he talked about the evolution of international law and how international law was used to curb the excesses and hold uh, state um, actors to account, all the way through from the birth of a nation state to the death of a nation state and arbitration between states. And I, I think actually the law can evolve in a similar way to hold technology to account by using concepts around how technology is developed, how technology is held to account during its lifetime, what happens when there's mistakes and who's held to account. There are gaps, as I talked about at the start, but I think we have to start to think about the law around this technology as being quite empowering and allow people to start to use those frameworks to hold that technology to account. Thanks, Rahul, that's really interesting. And Corey, I know you've touched on this already in your introductory remarks, but you know, one of the things it felt to me like you were gesturing towards is that law is part of the answer and litigation is part of the answer. But you know, you're asking people to get involved in analysing documents and it feels like a, a move towards something more participatory than just perhaps a traditional setup of a legal challenge of a client and a lawyer in front of a judge and then a decision that perhaps not very many people would be able to access or understand. So what do you think law needs alongside it to create the kind of movements for change that would actually result in greater equality and greater transparency and greater accountability? Well, for one, it needs journalists like Adam to help us study and, and test what's actually going on with these systems. But I think it also needs all of us uh, to recognize that power is actually being exercised here, right? The only when people see power being exercised do they act to take it back, right? And I think with the platforms, for example, with platforms like Facebook or Google, I think we saw for a very, very long time that they kind of amassed almost state-like uh, power over the public square. I mean, it's particularly stark now that all of us are at home, but it was it was true before as well, right? Where about a third of the planet use a Facebook-owned or operated service every day, right? Um, I think they, they, they managed to kind of ramp up and build that usership and that extraordinary power base um, almost free of regulation, basically because of a kind of, as far as I can tell, kind of a branding exercise, right? Well, it's like, well, how could they be giant powerful corporations when they all like wear hoodies and ride skateboards to work, right? But, but actually, I think, I think the penny has dropped and people now realize that in fact, what's happening is that power is being exercised and you see it in all different kinds of ways. So one of the movements I'm most excited about that sort of sits alongside some cases that we're bringing is the uh, increasing politicization of the tech workers themselves. So uh, in the last couple of years, you may be familiar with some of the Google walkouts where a whole bunch of Google staff first protested some defense contracts, Google's AI foray into defense contracting with something called Project Maven. Um, then, uh, then also a walkout about kind of sexual harassment payouts to Andy Rubin and some others. But that was the beginning of a, of a wider effort to exert worker power. They, those Google workers then extended their hands to the kind of contract workers. Now we're seeing that. Let's talk about Black Lives Matter for a minute. We're starting to see the Facebook workers starting to do a walkout of their workplace saying, hey, Mark Zuckerberg, there is a, a direct threat to our fellow citizens with the president inciting violence on Facebook. And you're basically doing nothing about it because you don't want the right wing to get up and be like, ah, we're being shadow banned. It's not fair. All of this. And, and the workers are the ones who have exerted that power.
Um, we at Fox Club have just helped some content moderators, so really the people on the front lines of this public discourse, uh, today to put out a solidarity statement with those employees saying, well, we're in too precarious an employment situation, frankly, to walk out. We don't get to do that with you. Uh, but we are the people who are seeing this every day, who are seeing uh, racism, hate speech, police brutality coming up in our queues. And actually there is a lot more that Facebook can do. So when I think about something like um, Fox Gloves work with damages actions for content moderators, these people who clean and protect the public square for us, but are given post-traumatic stress disorder as, as a result of their trauma. I don't see that as a kind of narrow legal run through where we go and we get a, a little bit of compensation for people and that suddenly fixes everything from Facebook's perspective, right? Like they put, uh, the, their stock went up after a multi-billion pound fine to the FTC. So that's not going to be sufficient uh, to persuade an entity like that to change course. What will persuade them to change course, I think, is everybody collectively letting them know that their conduct is unacceptable. Thanks, Carly. So we've just got a few minutes left, and I wonder whether perhaps Ravi, I can come back to you um, on the question of evidence. So. Often we're talking when we're having these conversations about quite ephemeral concepts like privacy. Um, and it's, it's easier to imagine when, you know, thanks to the work of people like Adam, you can say someone didn't get a job or someone didn't get parole or someone did get beaten up by the police because of this racist or biased algorithm. But when you're moving into a domain of things like false information, it's very hard to evidence one person who has been harmed in a kind of legal sense of the word by misinformation on Facebook, for example. And the state very often has the monopoly over what the public good looks like. And for the state, the public good, and often for private companies as well, is them holding power. So how is it when you approach some of these cases, and I'm thinking particularly about your work around Cambridge Analytica, how do you evidence the harm that things like a privacy violation actually does to an individual, but also to the fabric of democracy and the public good? That's a fantastic question. So I think I can look at this from with two different hats on. So I have my work with Oxford Internet Institute, but also my work as a litigator. So if we take the, the idea of how data has affected democracy, I mean, there's been a lot written about this um, and there's been a lot said about how this space needs to evolve, particularly from a legislative framework. If we take the case against Cambridge Analytica and what we're trying to show, we're trying to show that the use of data can impact our um, or an individual's participation in democracy. And what we wanted to know is, well, well how does that happen? So we asked the question to Cambridge Analytica, what data do you have and, and what do you do? How do you process that data? Who do you give it to? And it was those simple questions that led to transparency around what they were actually doing. They were profiling individuals on the basis of their political beliefs. And then we took that, that what was happening, and we looked at all the different frameworks that sit around that technique. We said this was not fair as a matter of data protection law. It was misusing sensitive personal information regarding political beliefs. But also, it was also misusing data. It was taking confidential information about how somebody believes politically and providing this to third parties without any knowledge or consent or involvement of an individual. And it was using those quite basic frameworks of um, traditional human rights law to say to a company, the corporate acts you are doing right now are not lawful for the following reasons, and you, you have to stop what you're doing. And one of the solutions we try to push for in the court was to say, we need an order from the court. It's not about money. We need an order to stop this company from processing the data in the way, in the way they are. And I think it's, it's those concepts of trying to change behavior within a company that will lead to a lot of change in the way com uh, companies behave and corporate misuse of, of information. But there's also a policy angle, which is why we have set up AWO to look at not just cases, so I'm doing the legal side, but we have Eric Kind and Ben Hayes doing compliance and policy work, because we think we are looking at a, a, a bigger issue than just what the law can do here. We have to affect the way law is shaped, the way the law is applied, and the way the law is enforced. And I think it's a really exciting discussion to be having because we have organizations like Corey's, the work that Adam's doing, other people like Carol Cadwallader and other great journalists are looking into these spaces. I think we're about to see a lot of change. I think, as Corey said, the penny's dropping. I think we're, we have to continue these conversations. We're at the start of the conversation. But the way we use the law is starting to change because of the conversation around the law is developing as well. If I could just jump in. Um, the 
it is this a really fascinating moment right now from a from a policy perspective in Europe and and I think to a bit of a lesser extent in the United States, although it varies from state to state. Um, but you see governments now kind of really putting the rubber to the road in terms of different policies in which uh, how some of these platforms can be regulated. You've seen some of this happen already um, with. A GDPR, of course, but also as it comes to like hate speech in, in Germany. Um, and something that I'm just sort of keeping an eye out for uh, as I report on this topic is, is the unintended consequences of these. I mean, there, there, it's often when we t get into these discussions of technology that we're, we're talking about the downsides of them. And there's, a, there's a, a, an immediate instinct, of course, to want to sort of regulate that. But you know, these are very big, sprawling platforms uh, that touch many different things. And as you can sort of try and regulate them in one way, but the fallout of that can have many unintended consequences. And so as policymakers try and grapple with that, I think it's a really sort of rich vein to keep an eye on uh, and be wary of as, as you see. I'm just sort of cautious when I, when I, when yeah. I see this sort of urge to just immediately like, well, let's regulate by doing this. It's like, okay, well, what is, what's the consequence of that going to be? And I think just to finish a point about that is the online harms bill that's coming through in the UK can have the potential to really shrink this space in a way that probably nobody on this conversation or nobody listening wants. And it's such a um, fraught area can have so many ill consequences for, for democratic participation, but also our, our access to online services. And it's really, it's a hard space to regulate because it's a space that touches everything we do. On that note, <laughs> so I think we're gonna have our break in a couple of minutes and then we'll move into the breakout sessions and people can start feeding their questions back for um, the panelists. But it just, thank you so much to the three of you for sharing your thoughts. It feels like such a rich theme of discussion. Um, I don't know if there would be many talks where we would kind of cover state racism to algorithmic decision making to everything in between. So I'm really grateful to you all. Um, enjoy your coffee break and we will see you all uh, in a few minutes time. Thanks. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.